All right, so let's talk about cosmological arguments. Notice that uh, you know I have the the s on, on the end in parentheses because there really are multiple arguments um, in throughout history, um, not just a single argument. It, it's more like a family of arguments. Um, and here are my sources. You can look into those. Um, so when it comes to cosmological arguments generally. They start with the observation that things exist, so it's a posteriori, namely it relies on observations about the world, and um, they attempt to argue for the existence of a unique being. For example, one that's necessary um, or one that's self-existent, and, and we'll talk a little bit about those terms later on. But basically, yeah, you start with something exists, therefore there's some unique being who brought it into existence or brought all of this into existence. And um, so, so the main questions for the cosmological argument are these. Why is there something rather than nothing? Does everything require an explanation? Can something come from nothing? So I remember being a kid and thinking, uh, what, what is nothing like? And, and having a really hard time with that. Uh, and uh, picturing black, but thinking, no, that, that's still something. Picturing white, and no, that's still something. Just trying to picture nothing and what it would be like if there was nothing. Well, there would be nothing that it's like. But um, anyway, uh, the question for the cosmological argument is, why is there something rather than nothing? Where did all this come from? So here you have the universe, right, Star, starry night, or a model of the universe, and you wonder, where, where did the universe come from? Okay, does everything require an explanation? If so, then you're driven to something like uh, a unique being, I think. Um, but if not everything requires an explanation, then you can have, so to speak, uh, brute facts, facts that go without explanation, facts that have no explanation. Yeah, for example, uh, the universe is just there, and that's all. Uh, that's what that's what Bertrand Russell said. Uh, can something come from nothing? Uh, maybe the universe isn't just there. You know, ha hasn't just been there for all of eternity. Maybe it popped into existence out of nowhere, um, from nothing, with no explanation. Right. So here. Imagine, like, first there's nothing, like literally nothing, not Lawrence Krause nothingness, um, but actually nothing. And then, boom, you've got this, right? Just an explosion, and um, you get something from nothing. Is that possible? What's, what's the most reasonable thing to believe, that you can or that you can't get something from nothing? So what do you think? Uh, can we get something from nothing? I, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Um, and I think the answer that you give to that question um, largely uh, will tell you whether you, you're going to think the cosmological argument uh, um, is successful or not, or or at least the kernel uh, uh, kernel of um, truth or or the um, core of the cosmological argument. So some proponents you've got these. These fellows, Plato, Aristotle, Al Ghazali, uh, Thomas Aquinas, Samuel Clark, Leibniz, Richard Swinburne, William Lane Craig. So you've got, you know, um, Plato, Aristotle, Al Ghazali, uh, Thomas Aquinas, Samuel Clark, where Samuel Clark, Leibniz with his luscious locks, uh, Richard Swinburne right here, who is still living, and William Lane Craig, who's still living. And we'll talk a little bit about William Lane Craig later on with his Kalam cosmological argument. So some opponents, um, David Hume, a giant when it comes to Western philosophy, Immanuel Kant, um, <clears throat> and Bertrand Russell, a 20th century atheist. I already quoted him earlier in the lecture. The universe is just there and that is all. So when it comes to cosmological arguments, uh, we can distinguish between, uh, in the wording of William Rowe, uh, self-existent beings and dependent beings, or in the wording of Samuel Clark, uh, more like it. 
So self-existent being is, uh, uh, okay, so, so a couple of things that it's not, it's not a being that brings itself into existence. That's nonsense, that nothing can bring itself into existence. That involves a contradiction. Um, because in order to bring yourself into existence, you have to exist prior to your existence. Um, so prior to your existence, you both exist and you don't exist, um, which is a contradiction. And when I say prior, I don't necessarily mean temporally prior, maybe logically prior. OK, um, so it's, so that's not what we're talking about when we mean self-existent being, when we when we refer to a self-existent being. And it's not simply an eternal being that does not exist by the causal activity of some other beings. So when Bertrand Russell says the universe is just there and that's all, he's talking about the universe as an eternally existing thing um, without any cause. And that's not, I mean, uh, without any cause or maybe even without any explanation. Um, that's not that's not all that we're talking about when we talk about a self-existent being. Certainly a self-existent being um, would be eternal, um, but uh, it's not simply an eternal being. We mean um, that the being exists by an absolute necessity originally in the nature of the thing itself. So it exists according to its own nature. There's something about its nature that entails uh, that it must exist, right? And this is Samuel Clark's kind of um, wording here. So um, it's not simply an eternal being that's just there. It's a being that exists by the necessity of its own nature. So its essence is to exist, we might say. What is a dependent being? It's something that is produced by another, in the words of Samuel Clark, a being that is produced by another. So examples, me, you, uh, the Statue of Liberty, unless I'm talking to uh, a self-existent being here, I think you are dependent. Mount Everest, black holes, pencils, rocks, bacteria, dolphins, Justin Bieber, feathers, jambalaya, your mama, crocodiles, asteroids, etc. These are all dependent beings, um, beings that are produced by another. All right. Um, and so the self-existent being was not produced by anything. It exists out of necessity of its own nature, but you and me, we came from somewhere. For example, me, you know, I came about through the causal activity of my parents. Don't want to go into too much detail there. And, you know, here I am. I haven't always existed. Um, even if I've always existed, it doesn't mean I'm self-existent. Um, is it part of my nature to exist or do I just exist and that's all? Um, so to exist by the causal activity of another is to be dependent um, and to exist by the necessity of your own nature is to be self-existent. And those two concepts are really important when you're talking about uh, at least uh, Samuel Clark's cosmological argument. Okay, so some versions, including Clark's uh, cosmological argument, rely on the principle of sufficient reason. What is the principle of sufficient reason? Um, well, uh, here is a quote from Samuel Clark. Um, whatever exists has a cause, a reason, a ground of its existence, a foundation on which its existence relies, a ground or reason why it does exist rather than does not exist, either in the necessity of its own nature, and then it must have been of itself eternal, or in the will of some other being, and then that other being must, at least in the order of nature and causality, have existed prior to it. All right, so anything that exists has a reason why it exists rather than not, has a cause of its existence or a ground of its existence. All right, there's going to be some sort of explanation for why it exists rather than not. I mean, I think at first glance, the principle of sufficient reason seems right. My intuitions tell me at least, my rational intuitions um, tell me that the principle of sufficient reason is right, that every being has a ground of its existence a, or a cause or uh, a reason for its existence. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretend I'm walking through the woods with a friend and um, we come across this glowing orb, as you, you see in the picture. 
And my friend says, oh my, oh my gosh, like, look at that thing. Where did it come from? Right? Like, what's, what's going on? And I say, oh, you know, like, um, that's just one of those things. It's a, it's just always been there. There's no reason um, uh, for its existence. It, there's, there's no sort of explanation for how it got there. And um, I don't think you, you know, if you're my friend, I don't think you'd be very satisfied with that. I think it's a natural thing um, and an intuitive thing to think that there would be a, a reason why it's there or how it got there, right? Um, uh, a, a reason how, uh, for how it got there or a, a cause of its existence um, or an explanation. So, so something that I, I'd like to clear up a little bit is um, that, that I've, been, I've been saying something like the purpose or the, the why for, for an object. And I don't mean, um, you know, something, I don't really mean something's purpose, like why is it there? Um, I mean how. I don't mean why, I mean how. How did it get there? What's responsible for it? I don't mean why in the sense of what is its purpose for existence, right? Okay, so principle of sufficient reason doesn't say that everything has a purpose for its existence. It says that everything has an origin or explanation of its existence. So everyday experience might tell you that the principle of sufficient reason is true. You know, you don't just um, see things popping into existence for no reason whatsoever. Everywhere you go, you can see that things have an explanation, an origin, a cause, that sort of thing. And then science, um, uh, science uh, sort of... Uh, science gets going on the assumption that um, things have explanations, right? Like governments uh, award people millions of dollars um, to go see why uh, something happened, where, where, where it came from, um, what particles interacted to bring it about, that sort of thing. And uh, the success of science is uh, be, uh, partly at least because uh, uh, we assume that we can figure out what's going on. You know, what's the reason for this thing's being here? How did it get here? So, yeah, I mean, the, on the face of it, the principle of sufficient reason does does seem right. It seems very rational. I mean, what's the alternative to believe that um, that something can come from nothing, I, I, I suppose, or something has, uh, there's no explanation for its existence. It's just a brute fact. And uh, so you might ask, what's more reasonable to believe that there are no brute facts or that, you um, that, or, or that uh, everything has an explanation. Okay, next we'll consider uh, the Kalam cosmological argument and Samuel Clark's cosmological argument.